Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Grace. I, uh, I don't know about you, but one of the reasons I'm here is that I'm is that trying to live my, my, my own strength and resources is never enough. <laughs> it, it, it never measures up. I need the grace of God in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that through all of the means by which he chooses to work that grace in my heart, worship, fellowship, prayer, the word, that's a powerful combination. And that's what I, I need this morning. It's what we all, all need. Let's prepare our hearts to sing. sing. Stand as we, as we do so. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise. Justice, God. You use the weak to be the strong. You need us in the song of your salvation. And other people sing along. So enough? Amen. Amen. As you said it like you believe it. <laughs> well, good morning. Welcome to everyone here at Grace and those who are connecting digitally as well. We're glad that you're here worshiping the Lord with us today. We're, it's good to be in the presence of the Lord. We like to uh, take this opportunity each week to fill out our connection card and it's it's we ask our, our guests and regular attenders each week to do that and it's a short it's a short card it's a connect card and you can just text the word to the number 
that's there on the screen to get started. And we appreciate you doing that and using that card because it helps us to know that you're here and it helps us to better stay connected with you as well, especially those of you who are online. So please take a, a moment to complete the card and once you, once you send the text message, you'll receive a text back in a second and, and it's a link to the connect card. And while you're doing that, I'd just like to remind you, if you've missed a service or, or, or something happens during the streaming, you can, you can always find these services, last week's service, on demand at gracedover.com slash online. Or you can click the watch live button on the home page. And you can access also uh, sermon in the sermon archive, sermons there on the home page. And again, thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Now, uh, the catechism teaches us some great truths, and we're at question number 44 as we're going through the catechism, and the question 44 asks, what is baptism? Let's read the reply together, the answer together. Baptism is the washing with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It signifies and seals our adoption into Christ, our cleansing from sin, and our commitment to belong to the Lord and to his church. Hallelujah, a commitment that we fulfill as we worship the Lord together. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your, your mercy and grace that has adopted us into your family. Uh, taking us from that position of, of orphans and slaves of, of the evil one and making us your, your sons and daughters through faith in Christ. We thank you for that uh, magnificent grace. We pray that you would stir, stir up an awareness of it at a deeper, in a deeper way in our hearts today that we might, might worship you more fully as we ought, with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Unify our hearts and our voices for your name's sake, we ask it. Amen. Our call to worship this morning uh, comes, oddly enough, from the mouth of a pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar. And we don't have time to tell the whole story, but the short of it is that, that God humbled him in, humbled him big time <laughs> uh, to the point that he said this, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar learned that very well. <laughs> uh, but let's humble ourselves with Nebuchadnezzar before the king of heaven uh, and join in praise. Let's stand as we sing. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of
Everlasting God speaks these words to us, saying, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Now let's humble our, continue to humble ourselves before him, acknowledging him as the one true God and turning from idols in the confession of our sin. Let's bow in prayer. Amen. Amen. This is the, the word of peace or assurance that the Lord speaks to your heart today if your faith and trust is in him. For the scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God, our God and Father. Rejoice. Rejoice in the gospel. Amen. Amen. Because of what the Lord has done for us, we are, we are called to offer ourselves to him. Paul wrote, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of, of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is your true and proper worship. Now, we've noted before that kind of offering referred to here as a living sacrifice alludes to the Old Testament burnt offering in which the whole sacrifice was burned on the altar before the Lord, 100%. How long does it take for us to get to 100%? You know, how about uh, 24-7 for a lifetime <laughs> or even eternity? Yeah. We need to give ourselves, offer ourselves to the Lord as a response of gratitude for his grace. If you are giving financially today, we remind you that you can give online at gracedover.com slash online or by text message or by mailing a check. And you can also place checks in the offering box at the rear of your worship area after the service today. Uh, as we sing our offering song, we are children ages four through fourth grade can go to, to children's worship. Um, let's stand now as we uh, dedicate our lives to the Lord.
I will lift my eyes. My eyes to the hills. In my hand is come. your peace on your oh your peace you give me in time of a storm you church life prayer folks today. Uh, you might say that we have a, a focus of which we have answered prayer coming before us as the pastoral search committee has been laboring for uh, over a year and God has answered the prayers of many in, in this that we have a top candidate to present to the church in, in Joshua Suh. Joshua is going to come and, and give us a testimony before we pray and continue to pray. Come on, Joshua. Good morning. Uh, yeah, it's good to see you. Wow. Uh, so I was asked to give a couple minutes of just uh, introduction and uh, testimony, and so uh, my name is Joshua Sa. Uh, I am married to my wife, Donna, and we have a five-year-old that just, um, just left us. Um, we are so glad and honored and privileged to be uh, with you this morning. Uh, I grew up as a second-generation Korean-American, uh, as you probably noticed. Uh, 
And um, my parents immigrated here um, separately in the 70s, and then they got married, and they had myself as well as I have an older brother. Uh, we, I, I grew up mostly in the West, uh, mainly in a little town called Las Vegas. I'm not sure if you know. Um, yeah, you don't meet many people uh, from Las Vegas. Uh, but that's where I grew up, and uh, I grew up as a pastor's kid. My father is also a minister, and so he uh, was in charge of leading a small Korean immigrant congregation in Las Vegas, and they're still there. Uh, but that's how I grew up, and I didn't grow up particularly understanding the the grace of God and what Jesus did for us on the cross until uh, it was my junior year of high school and through just you know God's providence and many just situations coming together I think God really focused my heart to him and I finally understood what Jesus had done for me and how just great that grace was uh, that he gave upon me. And so that's when my, my life was totally changed and transformed. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at pictures even, or if you knew me before that, before my junior year, you probably wouldn't recognize me at all today. Uh, but that's how much God just, you know, he revealed through his word that gospel message. And it was the most beautiful thing. It was the greatest thing I'd ever, ever encountered or experienced. And from that moment on, I decided that my life is no longer my own, but that I would, you know, really dedicate it to the Lord. And in that process, God called me to go to South Korea, which is, of course, um, the, the, the land of, of my, my ancestors and my, my mom and my dad. And uh, I had no previous plans to go back, but the Lord really moved through my situation again. And so we ended up, I ended up there for quite some time, uh, really experiencing more of the grace of the Lord. And I love the song that we just sang, uh, Your Grace is Enough, because it, I truly came to, to know that His grace was sufficient and, and even more than enough for me. That's where I really grew in my faith, uh, by just the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, and He really solidified the calling that He had given to me through Korea and helped me to really grow as a Christian. And of course, uh, meet my wife and, and have our family as well in Korea as well. And so now we are back in Marietta, Georgia, uh, which is down south. Uh, it was a big culture change for, for even me growing up in the West. I think they have their own culture and uh, their own thing down there. And so we're getting acquainted there. Uh, but in this process, the Lord has been just so great to us. And it, you know, I don't know if I'm supposed to give a testimony of how this all this process came together and maybe I can do that some other time but I just know that God loves this church we are sure of that and we know that um, God must love us too uh, for bringing us here and so we are just grateful we're grateful to be here thank you Joshua we'll hear more from him in a minute now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord Jesus, as we bow before you, we are grateful to be able to offer to you total praise. Thank you for being the strength of our lives. And Lord, and it's for this reason we bow and, and Lord, and lay our burdens and give our burdens to you. And we are grateful that you hear us when we call. We're thankful for the way that you have worked through the pastoral search committee and in bringing to us Joshua Suh as a candidate. We thank you, Lord, for this strong sense of the work of your hand in bringing Joshua and Donna and Nathaniel here. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to confirm your will in his time with our congregation, and Lord, and in the congregational meeting next week. Father, we, we also give you thanks for our Presbytery, Heritage Presbytery evangelist, Doug Perkins, who is now serving as a pastor in a renewal work with Manor Church. We praise you, Lord, for the unique opportunity that they have that's been given to them, Lord, with this Chinese immigrant congregation to join them 
And Lord, and for them to be able to change the, the name of the church to Gospel Church for All Nations. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless their fall and winter outreach in their, in their very diverse neighborhood. We ask, Lord, that you would enable them to reach them with the gospel. Bless their midweek Zoom Bible studies, Lord. Bless, bless the groundbreaking for a new facility, Lord, that's been postponed to the spring of 2021. Give Doug wisdom in, in leading this unique work. And we pray also, Father, for continued healing for Pam, Doug's wife, Lord, following the surgery and radiation therapy for breast cancer. Lord, make your presence known to her. Father, we, we lift up to you too, our nation and the elections, Lord, that are before us, both nationally and, and locally. We pray, Lord, that your will is done. As we lean upon you, Lord, and trust you and know that you're, you are good in whatever the outcome may be. We pray too, Father, that you would give us peace. And now, Lord, we turn to you in, in prayer with those things that are on our hearts, Lord, for, for family members and friends in our, of our church, brothers and sisters, as we think of Jonathan Seda and his family, and Lord, as they grieve the loss and the home going of, of his mother, Mary, and Lord, we rejoice that she is freed. And we rejoice that you, Lord, are able to comfort and meet the family where they are. We pray too, Lord, for strength for Caitlin Wilkes as she continues her chemo treatments. Lord, enable her to stand underneath all of this. And bless her family, Lord, and continue to express their love for her, Lord, and to you. And now, Father, hear us as we silently lift up prayers to you that are, that are on each of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us when we call. Gracious Lord, we come before you this morning just in awe of your great love, your steadfast love, your patience with us, as well as your grace. We thank you that you are always sovereign and that you are always almighty. And so we come before you humbly, Lord, come before your word that is living and sharper than a double-edged sword, able to pierce through our barriers and and blocks and hardened hearts that we have put up before you. You are able to come through into our brokenness, healing and mending us again. And so, Father, we come before your word asking that your spirit would move in this place, move to the ears that are listening online and at home. We pray, Lord, that your word would truly once again Renew our minds so that we may understand the gospel message and that your spirit would move us to live according to your ways. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Uh, as I just uh, gave a testimony, my name is Joshua Sa, and it is truly my privilege and honor to be before you to be able to share and deliver the Word of God. Uh, if you would with me, please open your Bibles, and we will be in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 20 through 31. If you are able to, 
please stand with us as we read the word of God in Romans chapter 3 verses 20 through 21, uh, 31. I didn't have the version I believe that your church usually uses, uses, so please forgive me. I will be reading in the English standard version. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I know for most of us here, uh, October 31st is a day where we celebrate a season of um, Halloween. We, it's, it's a merry uh, kind of festive time where we are able to dress up in costumes and also trick or treat for some of the children here and maybe some of the adults as well. <laughs> However, for us as Christians, I think October 31st has far more meaning. It has a deeper meaning to that because we know that uh, in tradition, October 31st was the day that Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses uh, on that Wittenberg uh, church. And its far greater meaning is in Martin Luther bringing up issue before the Catholic Church of whether we are saved and justified before God because of our works or because of faith. Now, Martin Luther certainly didn't come up with this uh, and, and suddenly have objections to the Catholic Church just in a day and suddenly decide that he wants to uh, make up 95 Theses. But this was actually a culmination of many, many years where the tradition and the reformed faith, right, justification by faith alone, had been transformed into a type of works salvation. And so salvation had become works where the gift of God's free grace was tainted with things that were to be done by man. And the atonement of Christ alone had been expanded so that forgiveness could be given by the clergy or the pope or through sacraments or indulgences. The true exegeting of God's word uh, could not be found any longer. And it was replaced with hidden agendas by the clergy or the church maybe to raise money, raise funds, and so that was a big practice, the indulgences. And so it was to this regard that Martin Luther, as he delved into the Word of God, was convicted by the Holy Spirit, and that he realized that, no, we are not saved by any work that we can do before God, but we are only justified before God as righteous through faith alone. And so through the providence of God, he raised up reformers and Protestants, and he filled them with his spirit. And they stood for what is true, and it sparked a reformation, the great reformation, the greatest reformation in our history. And it was the, this reformation that we pull five points, the five solas, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, sola scriptura, and soli deo gloria or only faith, only grace, only Christ, only scripture, and only to the glory of God. Amen. And because of what these great reformers filled with the Holy Spirit were able to stand up for more than 500 years later, 
we are able to gather this morning and praise our God for his grace and for justifying us to himself through Jesus Christ in faith alone. And that's why we still call ourselves Protestants or Protestants today as well. And so we come to the passage today in Romans chapter 3, where Paul describes this great doctrine of sola fide, or justification by faith alone. It's the point that Luther really honed in on during that great reformation. It's really what he grasped onto that really surrounded these uh, 95 theses that he wrote. It was that we are only able to receive salvation by the grace of God, and we are only justified through the faith that we are given. However, those who were Christians, those who were maybe under this law of God, following the commands of God, they made it a point. They argued that for them, they were able to attain this salvation. They were able to, through merit and good work, they were able to add on to this salvation by faith. And so they came up with many, many things. But as Paul tells us in Galatians, by no means can we add anything to the gospel. Paul states in verse 20, the reason why I wanted to read from verse 20 all the way to 31, usually we would read from 21 to 31, but I wanted to highlight this portion as well. In verse 20 he says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul highlights in previously, uh, before the passage we read today, that we are all sinners, that there is absolutely nobody who can be justified before God, before God. Uh, before God in works because we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And he further makes this point in Galatians 2, 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we have also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 19th century theologian Andrew Jukes, he states it very well. He says, ironically, if we think we can be righteous by keeping the law, then we have missed the point of the law. The law was not given as a means of justification before God. It was to help us realize who God is. It was to realize that we are sinful and that we can never, ever attain this salvation through our works. The law was given to us so that we can understand the grace of God, his steadfast love for us despite our sins. And so then it is not through the law, it is not through works that we are given this justification, but only through faith in Christ Jesus. This was such an integral and important point that Martin Luther states himself that this passage is the chief point of the entire Bible. And furthermore, he made this statement, justificatio est articulus, stantis et candentis ecclesiae. You all understood what I just said, right? <laughs> it means justification is the article by which the church stands or falls. To Luther, it was this understanding of sola fide, justification by faith alone in Christ Jesus, that he believed the church would either stand or fall. If the church does not understand sola fide correctly, he believed that the church would fall. And so this brings us to this significant doctrine, sola fide. What is justification by faith alone? Well, first we have to then answer what justification is. And we're going to look at a quote from a theologian named Douglas Moo. He says, to be justified means to be acquitted by God from all charges that could be brought against a person because of his or her sins. This judicial verdict, for which one had to wait until the last judgment, according to the Jewish theology, is according to Paul rendered the moment a person believes. In other words, justification is the complete forgiveness. It's the atonement of the sins that we have all of the unrighteousness, all of the transgressions that we have before God. Justification is wiping all of that clean. 
It's actually a, a ju judicial term, he says. It's used in court to say all of the charges against you. You are not guilty, but you are innocent. And so Paul tells us that we are justified before God through faith in Jesus Christ at the moment that we believe. It doesn't happen progressively after we come to faith and we have to work for it. But at the moment that we believe, we are justified as righteous before God. And that is a great thing. If we believe that we have to live by works to somehow appease God and gain merit before him, that's quite bad news for us. Because as we read in verse 23, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He states again in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So then if we are not justified before God through faith in Christ, if we have to work for it, Paul says it's impossible because we are sinners and we'll still be sinners and we'll always be sinners and we'll never be able to truly attain this salvation. And so then the wages of sin is death, eternal condemnation for us. Now, if Paul stopped at verse 23, I think we'd all be in big trouble and we would all be left hopeless, but he doesn't. In verse 23, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but, he continues, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So it is by faith that we are justified and righteous before God. It is by faith that by the blood of Christ, the wrath of God has been satisfied and appeased. And it is only by faith that in Christ we have been redeemed back into a loving relationship with God. Not by works, but by faith. The only requirement is faith. And even faith, Paul says here, is a gift that has been given to us by the grace of God. It's a gift. Now, I don't know about you, but a gift, I've never had to pay for a gift. I've never had to pay for a present that has been given to me. Because if I have to pay for something that's given to me, it's just called a business transaction, right? I just go to the store and I pay the person and they give me a gift or just something I paid for. Now, a gift is something that we do that is irrational, it's unreasonable, it's unmerited. So when it's someone else's birthday, we give them a gift, not because they deserve it, but because we love them. It's unmerited, but we give them a gift. On Christmas, we love to give presents, we, we love to give gifts to our children. Why? Not because they deserve it, and <laughs> not because they were good, but because we love them. It's unmerited, it's a gift. And that is exactly how Paul describes how God has given us justification. We had absolutely nothing to do with it. It wasn't because of our great works. It wasn't because of what we did or who we are before God. If it were, then none of us would deserve it. But in fact, it's a gift that he has given us. And so Paul states again in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So then we have absolutely no part of our salvation. And this is great news. Since then, we have no part in our salvation. We can't take credit for any of it as well. Yet oftentimes, I believe that we want to take credit unknowingly in our lives. We believe that God starts something, he gives us saving faith, but we have to bring it to completion. And I've found this in my own life as well. God is good enough, he's gracious enough, he's faithful enough to reveal the gospel message to me, but now it's up to me to make it up. Now it's up to me to complete it through my works, through my merit, through my actions. But this isn't what the gospel message is. This isn't what Sola fide, justification by faith alone is. 
There's nothing that we can do. There's not, nothing we boast in. There's nothing we can take cre credit for in this. Now, this is what the Israelites were guilty of. After God saved them from Egypt, after he showed them his sovereignty and his grace, after even he brought them into the promised land, they fell away. They continued to look to the laws, to their rituals, to the commandments for them to be saved rather than God himself. They ended up replacing Almighty God with their laws and their traditions. As Tim Keller says, for many of us, we have a theoretical commitment to the doctrine of justification, but in their daily uh, existence, they rely on their sanctification for justification. Their sanctification for their justification. Drawing their assurance of acceptance with God from their sincerity, their past experience of conversion, their recent religious performances, or the relative infrequency of their conscience, willful disobedience. How many of you, like me, have maybe not prayed as much as you think you should? You haven't read your Bible as much as you should. Maybe the pandemic has made you a little bit more passive, maybe even indifferent. And when we approach God, we, we're, we're almost scared. We're, we're, we feel sorry and we're, we're guilty and we think, well, God must not love me anymore. He must not want to bless me anymore. He must not want to move in my life anymore because I haven't been a good Christian. Well, just as Tim Keller says, it is not our sanctification that brings about our justification. We have already been justified before Almighty God. And there's nothing that we can do, there's nothing we can do that will separate us from his love. There's absolutely nothing. And so Oswald Chambers, he writes, is going to be kind of long, so please bear with me. I am not saved by believing. I simply realize I am saved by believing. It is not repentance that saves me. Repentance is only the sign that I realize what God has done through Christ Jesus. The danger here is putting the emphasis on the effect instead of the cause. Is it my obedience, consecration, and dedication that make me right with God? It is never that. I am made right with God because prior to all of that, Christ died. When I turn to God and by belief accept what God re reveals, the miraculous atonement by the cross of Christ instantly places me into a right relationship with God. And as a result of the supernatural miracle of God's grace, I stand justified, not because I'm sorry for my sin or because I've repented, but because of what Jesus has done. The Spirit of God brings justification with a shattering, radiant light, and I know that I am saved, even though I don't know how it was accomplished. So then, we can say, well, if I'm justified by faith, and it's nothing to do with me, and even my faith is given to me as a gift, then can I just be lazy? Can I just live my life the way that I want? And of course, Paul, he knows what we're going to think. And so he answers that already in verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. When we are given faith, our hearts are regenerated. And through faith, we are driven and motivated to uphold the law because the law represents God. The law is the character of God. The law reveals the heart of God. And so as ones who now desire God and love God, we desire to keep his law. And so let us be reminded every day of this gospel message. The gospel message is not just for new believers or non-believers, but the gospel message is also especially for those who already believe, who know Jesus Christ, to remind ourselves every day of what Jesus has done for us on that cross, that he has given this gift of justification to us through faith alone. And when you see something beautiful, it attracts you, it inclines you to continue to want to see it or hear it or, or taste it, good food. The gospel message of Jesus Christ, that though we are undeserving, though we didn't do anything to attain it, that through faith, that we have been justified. This is the most beautiful thing that we will ever, ever know and experience. And when you hear or see or experience something beautiful, I don't know about you, but I, I wanna do it over and over again. If I eat a really, really good food, I wanna eat it again. I don't just forget about it, but 
comes back into my mind and I want to eat it again. The first time you fall in love with your spouse. You don't just reminisce on that memory. You want to meet that person again and again. You want to experience that beauty again and again. I don't know about you, but that gospel message, this justification by faith alone is a beautiful thing. It is the most beautiful thing. And so then our hearts must be inclined, not just to remember it one time, that one time where we first realized it, but every single day we must remember what Jesus has done for us, especially during this difficult time in our lives, in the world, in this pandemic. I talk to a lot of people that have become almost passive about their faith, and I ask them, well, Do you remember Jesus? Do you remember what he's done? Do you remember this gospel message every day? And they say, oh, well, I've never thought of that. This gospel message motivates us, even during the pandemic, to come and worship and gather together like this, to do things that the world looks at us and says, why would you do something like that? Aren't you scared? Aren't you fearful? But we say no, because the gospel message is so beautiful. The blood of Christ is our hope. Justification is our hope. And so this is how we are able to endure through these times, that we are able to understand and remember what Christ has done. And through this, the great love and mercy of the Lord will constantly help us to persevere through this time. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, that while we were still sinners, while we were still wretched, while we were still in our sin, that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our death, to pay the ransom for our sins. And so, Lord, we come before you this morning once again, praising you, glorifying you, thanking you, for what you've done on that cross for us, remembering that we are justified before you not by works, but we are justified before you by faith. And so we pray, Lord, that you would continue to stir up that faith in us, especially during this pandemic and this difficult time in our world, that, Father, you would be glorified through the faith that you have given us through your church. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joshua. Let's stand and sing this hymn of response.
hear the benediction. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Just a moment, we'll be uh, dismissed. Uh, with the ushers dismissing from the, the rear of the room first, uh, at least for the, the sanctuary and the gym. But we also are going to have Joshua and Donna stand just outside the sanctuary building. Uh, and we'll give them a chance to leave first at this time. And just a chance for everybody to greet them uh, a little bit more personally uh, as, you, as you leave today. Um, no other uh, announcements? Oh, yes, the congregational meeting next Sunday. Don't forget that. That will be right after the service next Sunday. There will be no Sunday school uh, next week. Uh, so that meeting will, will occur as soon as possible. We'll give the parents with kids and children's worship a chance to pick up their kids and then return to the uh, return for the meeting. You'll stay in the area where you where you're worshiping for the meeting <coughs> next Sunday, and uh, we'll be able to have people participate in the meeting from the sanctuary gym and pavilion. So. Uh, very well. Go in, go in peace. Have a good week.